Cool. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining me on day three of PowerShell Summit. This is a really fun experience being here. Um, it's the first time speaking here. I'm really excited to be here with all of you, and I really appreciate y'all coming to my session today. Uh, excited to talk about some stuff here. Um, now, before I get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a keeper of a pair of irrational Shibas. Uh, if you don't know Shibas, they are like cats where that you do not own them. They own you, and you just kind of let them live their lives and you live next to them. So uh, throughout this presentation, you may or may not notice some other references to Shibas. Just look out for that. Um, whoever figures out how many there are, uh, there's no prize. But um, for me, I'm also a huge video game enthusiast. I uh, spend some time working in the industry, um, worked at a, a game company where we're responsible for you know, creating the world's largest uh, cowboy simulator. Uh, it was great experience, but I've since left that world. Um, kind of in a, a new industry, new exciting stuff, still working with PowerShell a lot. I love PowerShell, obviously. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, uh, throughout my career, you know, the last 20 years of my career, spent a lot of time across all of IT, experiencing a lot, learning a lot through just certifications, and then in the last 10 years, uh, came to really fall in love with PowerShell. Um, it was that first, I think, Jeffrey Snover and Jason Helmick video for V3 that I saw that really changed my career and really start to help me advance my career. I've, I've used PowerShell throughout my career to, to elevate myself. Uh, and through uh, the New York PowerShell user group, thanks to Doug Fink, um, I came to learn a lot about PowerShell, just how to write better code. And from that, help myself write better code, not just in PowerShell, but in other languages as well. And I think it's a great utility, great uh, tool to start as a launch pad into other languages as well. Cool, so th this kind of next bit of the session is gonna be about kind of low code tools. That's what this whole session is really about. Low code tools for you in VS Code to help you write better code for yourselves. Uh, you know, the idea here is this should be JSON, XML, stuff that's not really making you reinvent the wheel every time you write in code, and that's the entire idea about this uh, whole presentation. You know, we're gonna focus in on writing plaster templates uh, and writing your modules and creating your modules through Plaster. Uh, taking snippets, and, and this is something that I love a lot and it's near and dear to my heart because I use them all the time. When I'm writing in one language and, and switching over to another, I can take a snippet and get a good reminder on how to write a specific type of, type of function, type of script, and I don't need to worry about all the requirements that I want in my, my function or script. It's all there in that snippet for me and I can just make a call to that. Uh, we'll take a little, brief look at VS Code tasks and, and key maps, if I can remember that. Um, those are helpful in, in their own ways. Um, I think the other two uh, components are definitely more important, though. Um, you know, th those are really the, the drivers for some of these things. Um, and then you know, we'll, we'll finish up kind of talking about ways that we can deliver these solutions so that you can be consistent not just for yourself when you're writing your code, but how your team uses that code as well. I think that's one of the biggest parts of this, is how do you get your team to be consistent about how they're writing their code and how do they deliver their code to everybody on your team. So this is all about making yourselves faster, making your team faster, making your code across your team consistent, making that code easy to manage, making it useful for everybody on your team to, to take that uh, you know, plaster template and build the modules that they need to build with the standards that you're setting. And really, it's, it's all about making easing the barrier to entry for new people on your team as they come on. They don't have to go into dig into docs, figure out what are your coding standards. They can use something like snippets, get the, the right uh, set of standards that you're setting, and you're not forcing them down a specific way. You're giving them the tools to succeed themselves. All right, so the first thing we're covering, Plaster. Um, Plaster is just a way to scaffold your, your projects. It's a great way to just develop your all of the files and functions that are required for you, and it is customizable to an extent. You know, there, there's limitations in what you, with what you can do with Plaster. There's only so much that the Plaster engine has, has in it, uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of aging at this point. There aren't, aren't many updates anymore. Um, it is also XML-based, so there is kind of a learning curve there, a little bit of time that you need to understand how to format your, your code inside of that XML to make it a little bit more re readable, a, a bit more friendly for you to use. But the thing is, once you get this template set, you can kind of use it forever. I've, I've used the same template for five years at a time, you know, maybe adding mi minor pieces to it, 
It's all about making and finding the right set of tools for your team and right standards that you want for your team and then just using that template for as long as you need it. You can kind of build onto those templates over time if you need to. All right, cool. So let's, let's get into a quick demo of just Plaster as itself on its own. Um, so the first thing you're gonna need to do is, is find that PS resource in the, the PS gallery. It's gonna be this one that is owned and, and managed by the DevOps Collective. Uh, and like I said, it, this hasn't been updated since 2022. And I think even then that was kind of a minor update. Um, it's not getting a ton of love since then. I, I think it still works very well for what it needs to do though. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just install that. Uh, and the nice thing about Plaster is it has these templates already built into it. So if you want to just start get started to today, you can do that right away. Um, you can use any one of these templates here. Uh, you know, there's only these, these two, but the, the one that you'll want for your script is probably gonna be the script module, and that'll get you started at least running a new um, module manifest. Uh, and so we're just gonna go ahead and, and create a new project and show you what that looks like. Uh, and I'm just putting this into my, my local app data folder. Uh, and then just targeting that template for the, that script module. Uh, and this is, if you haven't seen Plaster, this is kind of what uh, the actual interface is gonna look like. You know, it's gonna prompt the user for every step along the way and walk them through the process of creating a new module. And I'm just gonna give this a, a, a whatever name I want, I'm just gonna call this demo. Uh, and you can, you know, provide it a version if it's not gonna be the newest kind of uh, iteration for this. Uh, and there are some nice features that you can add in, you know, you see, that, as you can tell, it's kind of asking me for additional options that I wanna include for this. In this case, for Visual Studio Code, it's actually gonna create the Visual Studio Code project file, folder inside of the, the directory that it creates. So if you wanna include things like tasks or snippets or uh, any other kind of uh, pro uh, project-specific launching details, you can do that inside of that VS Code fo folder. Uh, and so when I run this, you know, it creates all these files here uh, and you know, actually shows you any kind of requirements that I might have. So in this case, it actually has a, a, a requirement for Pester to be included as well. Just gives you a kind of a quick alert that, hey, you already have Pester, you're good to go. Uh, and to take a quick look at that, you know, the, the folder structure, it's just that PSD1, PSM1, and I'm good to go. I have a, a script module that's ready to, to rock. Uh, and let's just take a quick look inside of VS Code, what that looks like. Yeah. So yeah, here, here's like, it's got that setting to JSON, uh, I've got my tasks in here. You know, these are gonna be kind of empty uh, for the most part. There's gonna be some stuff that's included because of the, the pester, or the plaster template that it came with, uh, but for the most part there is gonna be expecting you to fill in the rest of the information, anything that you want to go into the PSM one is now up to you to kind of build that new module for it. Um, and that's kind of kind of the, the general gist of creating a, a template, uh, and or rather invoking a template. Cool. <clears throat> so this structure is great. You know, this will get you very far with, with PowerShell. You can use just a PSM one and a PSD one, and that's perfectly fine. But it gets complicated when you're starting to think about what is your team of five, six people writing a 5,000 line module, what are they doing with this one PSM1 file when they're all contributing to it and you have to all merge and there's all sorts of conflicts and it gets really, really complicated. You know, that doesn't really scale very well. So I'm gonna take a little tangent and <laughs> talk about dot sourcing for a second. Uh, I don't know if any, everybody knows what dot sourcing is, but I think it's just good to level set here and get everybody on the same page as to what dot sourcing is, because I think it's a, a really great way to just elevate your uh, modules uh, so that you can actually uh, use the dot sourcing uh, technology to, to create modules that are very scalable, flexible, and easy to use. So dot sourcing, what is it? Um, when I run a script, uh, and I have this script that just is declaring a function, and if I run this script, it runs in its own scope. It's called the script scope. When this script ends, that script scope ends. It no longer knows about that function dec declaration. So if I were to run that function that I just declared, it has no idea that it ever existed. That's not great. 
but there is something called dot sourcing. So this period here at the, before you run the script, that'll actually pull it into the current scope of whatever the, the session is that I'm running at. Um, so now that I run this same fu function declaration, it's actually gonna run in my current session and allow me to output that, command, that function, whatever was in there, out to my main session. So that's just a very quick look at dot sourcing. So what does that mean in terms of module design and aspects? Well, what you wanna do is, and what I like to do is at least separate all of your functions into separate files for each one of your functions. Give it a consistent naming pattern. I like to take the, the name of the function and use that as the file name of the, the function that you're, you're trying to uh, write for. So your script is really just function, the function that you're writing inside of that one file. Uh, organize those files inside of different directories. Uh, I like to separate it into a public and, and private function folders. Uh, basically those private functions are gonna be ones that are exclusively running inside of the module, uh, not really intended for anybody to run directly. Uh, whereas the public functions are gonna be ones that you wanna advertise to users. You want people to use those functions. And really you're not even worried about um, what happens inside of your PSM1 file because the PSM1 template that you're gonna run is actually gonna be the thing that's hand handling most of that. It's gonna be outputting just a, a very templatized version of your PSM1 and it's gonna be going through and, and turning through all of your functions inside of each of your, your public and private folders and just dot sourcing them so that it's inside of that module scope that it's running at and then you're using export module member as a part of your PSM1 file to, to pull out the, the most important public functions that you want. Uh, and then yeah, part of this as well is also just simplifying your PSD1 uh, file as well. Uh, I think it's important to realize that you wanna use the tools that you have to make your life easier here. So I, I won't really touch too much on how you do this for your PSD1, but the PSD1 files, I almost never touch these either. These are things that you can uh, incorporate in part, as part of your CI-CD pipeline. So your CI-CD pipeline, whether you want to increment the versioning that should be something that pulls in from your semantic or, or conventional commits and understands what the next version is that you want to increment to. And that will allow you to not even worry about touching the versioning. Don't worry about your, your, uh, you know, your change log. That should get, also get pulled from Git. So as you're doing these conventional commits, all that change log information is getting incorporated as well. So really this is all about just trying to simplify what you're actually changing in your module. And really the only thing you're ever actually gonna be changing are those function files. So this is kind of ends up being the, the general structure that I like to follow. Like I said, each one of these um, functions or files inside of the public folder, that's just gonna be a script uh, that runs that has just that func function declaration and, and establishes your function inside of the, the module. Uh, and just slide over to the next demo here uh, of how to use dot sourcing. So I have, have a customized plaster template and I'm gonna run through just using that new plaster template. This is designed with dot sourcing in mind. And we'll go ahead and just open up that plaster doc here. Uh, so this is a plaster manifest if you've never seen it before. Like I said, it's an XML. Um, I've already organized this in a way that's a little bit more friendly and readable to me. I don't like using XML and, and a lot of cases it's kind of hard to read, but when you get it and you treat it kind of closer to what we're used to in splatting, I find this to be very easy to read now. Um, at the start of this, this plaster manifest, there's not a ton of uh, information that's related to anything that goes into the manifest. This is strictly uh, info and metadata for the manifest itself. Um, but where it gets interesting is inside of this parameters block, and this is where you can uh, establish any parameters or prompts that you want your users to enter. So remember when we're when I ran that plaster template or, or invoke plaster command at the start, uh, it gave me those prompts. This is how you actually write new prompts. And there's a couple different options for what type of, of templates or parameters these are gonna be. Um, so the text option is just a very simple string. Um, you know, you have these uh, username, full name option. This is kind of more customized, but, but it pulls in information from either your GitHub information. I like to just use whatever the, the local user account is on the computer. Um, but by, I think by default, it actually pulls from your, your Git history. Um, the other nice thing though, is there, there's options for pulling in choices. 
Um, so this is where you can give a, a user a list of a, a bunch of different options and they'd have to select one of those options. Uh, but there's also that, that multi-choice option where they can select from uh, a, a, a assorted array of options and then you want to give them whatever conditional uh, setup inside of that, that plaster um, output for whatever they're, they're actually, actually trying to do. So in this case, you know, if, if I want to write this for uh, GitHub, I can include a .github file if I wanted to put that as a conditional on here. Um, and as I scroll down, this content block is actually where I'm doing the bulk of the work. Um, this is just kind of create kind of the, the blank folders. You know, it's not actually pulling anything from any of sources, but it's outputting to um, my customized directories. Uh, and these uh, are the actual parameters that I'd entered in at the, the parameter block and actually it understands each one of those parameter entries and just outputs it as, as a part of these entries. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the last nice thing about this is you can also templatize full files. Um, so when I actually have a file that has some references to variables inside the file, it can actually update those as well in, in a, the context of the file without actually having to do any other changes. You can do that as you, you create your plaster um, module. Cool. So let's go ahead and create a new uh, module with this new template. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and splat this settings for both the template path and the destination path in. And again, same kind of format, same step through process. I'm just gonna name this demo. And as you can tell, I'm already getting new uh, options. These are based on the parameters that I'd entered inside that, that plaster manifest file. And we'll just step through the rest of these. Um, Generally, this is gonna be just kind of the same idea, but as you can tell, it, it created a whole lot more files. These are all structured in the way that I wanted it to be. Uh, you know, you can be as opinionated as you want with this. this is, the entire idea is figure out what works for your team and build the, the template that works best for your team. Um, but it follows along with that same standard that I, I mentioned before. It even pulled in some snippets um, because I wanted that as a part of uh, this repo as well. Um, puts in my format folder and files, anything that you might have that you want to be consistent across your team is a great, great option. Uh, I definitely recommend looking into it a bit more. Now you might say, you know, looking at that XML file, that there's a lot of shit in there. It's way too much work for me to create that, I'm not gonna do it. There are better ways, um, and oops. I'd, this is just looking at the folder, but there's, there's there are easier ways and, and if you want to just get the quick and easy button, I would say just use Stucco. Um, Stucco does kind of the same setup. It uses dot sourcing for your, your modules, so it still has that nice um, manageability for your, your functions. Uh, it has that nice structure that I like to, to use. Again, very opinionated uh, on how to dot source, uh, but I like this option. I think it makes your team, my team, faster when we're trying to write new code. And I'll just cancel out of this because ultimately it is the same process, um, but you're just gonna run the new stucco module option and that will just create a new stucco. Uh, it'll run two plaster. It's essentially the same idea that I was uh, just showing you with the other uh, personalized pl plaster ma manifest, but this is specifically built into, pl uh, into stucco. Uh, <clears throat> yeah? Plaster, uh, I know you personal preference to use dot sourcing within your um, I know there might be some performance trade-offs rather than having all of your functions and create them on. Um, have you ever done any sort of testing? Or I haven't actually, no. I, I've, I've always thought of it as just the benefits of having that manageability as being a, a big payoff for me. Uh, I, don't, I haven't actually done full testing on, on whether or not it's a lot faster. I, I don't know. It's a good idea though. Uh, cool, so the next thing that I do want to talk about is snippets. Um, I like snippets as a way to uh, get my team ready. And, and snippets, snippets, snippets is absolutely the thing that you guys have gotta get, take out of this, is, is just remember that snippets are overlooked all the time because you know, they're, they're really easy to use, really uh, helpful, portable. You can build them and, and put them into your project and let 
anybody uh, pull down your repo and they also have that, that as a part of their uh, re repository, whatever their workspace is, you can actually utilize that directly from uh, the VS Code workspace. Um, and they're not exclusive to PowerShell. That, I think that's where I really find them to be the most useful. You know, if you've ever used the Bicep uh, extension, it literally works on just snippets, basically. It, the entire thing is snippets, and it's incredible because you can, you can dial in to whatever kind of specific resource that you might be needing, and, and it can pull in that as a, 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 a very, you know, self-contained kind of information for that, that resource, and it already has all that information for you. Um, you can get as granular with this as you want. I like to kind of keep it higher level just for how I want to get the most detailed information for my, my functions in place. Um, but if I'm switching into another language and I want to create a Python function or Python module and I kind of forget what I need to do for my specific requirements, snippets are a really great way to, to do this. And, and again, a great way for you to establish across your team how to templatize your information and what they're expected to write in your, inside of their code. And we'll jump over to snippets. So the, there are a couple ways to interact with snippets. Um, and you can either create them directly from your, your user configuration session. Um, so if you go to the command palette and type in just snippets, and you know, I've already typed this in, but if you go into here and go to configure user snippets, um, you'll be able to pull up any specific language snippets and anytime the VS Code window recognizes a specific language type, it'll recognize all the snippets that go into here. Now, I, I don't typically use the user configuration session ses settings because if I wanna share this with you, other people, it's not a great way to tell them, okay, go into your session, paste this into your settings. There are better ways of doing this and I'll show you that as well. Um, and I realized before we talk too much more about snippets though, I need to show you what it's actually doing. So let's go into um, my module here, oops, and create a new function. <clears throat> so if I'm creating a new function, and I'll just call us remove dash log for this module that I have here, and I get to this prompt, and you know, I need to actually create a, a snippet of code. I need to, you know, establish, okay, this is a function, I'm already typing it wrong, and I've, I've already messing this all up. Um, but what a snippet does is you can just type in a couple letters based on my prefix settings and it'll actually pull up the information for whatever snippet of code I want to enter in. So I've created this ps-advanced function. Uh, this is a, a workspace snippet as you can tell and it, it gives me this like small blurb about the description of what I want this to be. Uh, and it actually gives me the full um, layout of what that snippet will look like inside of my code. Now what's Extra special about this is it also has some environment variables that I'm also pulling in. And, you know, it actually filled out the, the function name for me. And just because I had the same file name, that same dot sourcing structure that I was talking about, it knew that the function was gonna be called the same thing. So I was able to quickly establish that. Um, but the nice thing about this is it's gonna tab you through. It's gonna guide anybody through the process of establishing all the important information for your function. So I want everybody to always fill out the synopsis field um, so, logs, and as you can tell, as I'm, I'm tabbing through, it's bringing me to the next field of important information that I want people to fill out, and, and I'm just continually tabbing through. Uh, and then the, you can also be pretty selective about what you want. Uh, you know, you can give different options for people. Um, so if I have uh, different object type, I can select a, a specific object type. This is just gonna be a string object and I, I, it'll actually recognize that as well. And then finally, when I'm done with everything else and I tab through everything else, it, it just drops me right into my process block and I'm ready to start coding right away. That's a really neat way of doing this. I, I think it's really helpful, like I said, for getting your standards across to people on your team, uh, getting them up to speed quicker without having to establish, hey, go look at this wiki page for your first three weeks, and memorize it. You can get standards built in this way. Um, now the other nice thing, so you know, I showed you how to get this 
through just modifying, uh, you know, running this prefix entry. We can also do is using the keyboard shortcuts, and if you've never looked at the keyboard shortcuts, this kind of goes on forever, uh, and you can kind of create sh keyboard shortcuts for anything in VS Code. Um, it's not a great way of <laughs> managing this. There, there is also a key bindings JSON file. Um, so I'd recommend doing this. Uh, and basically you can create whatever key combination you want. Right now I'm, I'm actually just using control P and followed by an F, so it's a sequence of, of characters. Uh, that will use that same uh, advanced function that I was calling just a second ago. Uh, and just to show that in practice here, what did I say, control P, F, oops. It just ran through, created that snippet, quick and easy way for you to, to run uh, you know, this, this quick, very templatized version of what I want my function to look like. All right, so let's talk about what this actually looks like behind the scenes though. Uh, what does that snippet actually look like? Um, so that advanced function one is, is probably the best one to look at. There's gonna be a lot in here to, to understand, um, but there's also great blogs about uh, all of these different things. So there's good uh, information on Microsoft Learn for Plaster, great, uh, Microsoft Learn doc for snippets as well. And th those all be included in the, the notes that follow on, uh, on the, uh, the summit page. Um, so the way this works is the prefix is just kind of those characters that I'm gonna enter in at, at function runtime that I want to uh, you know, establish what snippet to run. Uh, that description is what I'm just entering in. And this is just you know, straight JSON. It works with all the, the regular JSON rules and you have to make sure your spacing is, is well, spacing doesn't ne necessarily matter, but your punctuation definitely matters. Um, and then the body is just an array of every line inside of that snippet. Uh, each one of these is gonna immediately put in a return. So there, each one of these follows with a return. Uh, but if you want to establish extra white space, that's where that slash n is. Uh, that will add in some additional white space. Uh, and I think it's fairly obvious, but a slash t will include a tab. Um, so there's some some small, uh, you know, uh, I guess pieces that you need to understand how this works, but for the most part, it's just kind of pulling in uh, text and, and just translating it into your snippet. Um, now the nice thing about this is there's also some environment variables. So this, remember where it pulled in the, the function name? This is actually pulling in based on that file name. This is just pulling in, a me, uh, like this is part of the snippets um, uh, engine for you for lack of a better word, this is actually a, a, an option that you can pull in as an environment variable. Um, the other item here is, these are variables again, these are how I would actually tab through. So each one of these is numbered, and that's just gonna be the order that you're gonna step through in your function. So if you wanted to jump down further into the function, you can just use a different uh, se number sequence. Uh, the other nice thing here is that, you know, as I establish that this parameter name uh, is gonna be as a part of my comment base help, it also filled in that information further down here uh, and filled in that same entry further down. Uh, and then, you know, the, the rest of this is, is fairly straightforward, kind of follows around, along those same standards. Yes, not super friendly to read from this context, but I think as you test it out, you'll, it'll beco it becomes a little bit more clear as you're running it. Um, the last one is this kind of, um, you know, it, it's locked inside this, these two double bars. What this is is just your, your optional choice where it gives you multiple options. Just You feed in an array and that will be any of those options that you wanted as a part of your snippet. Uh, and then the very last thing is this dollar sign zero. When you use dollar sign zero, that's where it actually ends the snippet and drops you into the code. So that's where it brought me to the final process block. Everybody good? Cool? Awesome. So, that's all cool, but you know, how do I get that to my team? You know, I talked about I can use the the dot vs code folder inside of my project. I can use this dot snippets dash code. I can use the snippets uh, personal user extension uh, or user configuration file. That's an option, but I think another nice, neat way, and I don't know if it's the best way. It's just one way that I wanted to present here uh, is using a VS Code extension. Um, this process is actually a lot easier than I thought it was gonna be. Um, I've used this uh, previously to just kind of get a good baseline across all of our systems as people are, are onboarded onto the team. 
So they have a good way to have that snippet without even having to do any additional work. You can just incorporate that new package as a part of your configuration management system. Uh, whatever you're using SCCM, you can just dump this in uh, as a part of that uh, user setup. And we'll get into running this next. Uh, and yeah, if you've never used the, or built the VS Code processes, uh, extension processes, this is a, a little bit easier than I thought it was gonna be just because there are great tools already for this. Um, it's something called Yeoman Code Generator that I'm using. Uh, it does use NPM uh, just because it's an NPM package. Um, you don't really need Node.js once you've installed this and really once you've run the Yeoman Code Generator, you probably never need to do this ever again. Um, you could probably actually create a plaster module or plaster template to do what Yeoman code is doing as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and install Node.js. And then from NPM, I'm gonna install this Yeoman code generator. So it's just uh, yo and then space generator dash code. So go ahead and run it now. And the, the command to run Yeoman code is just yo code. And it'll take a second to actually start up, but you'll notice it's very similar to that plaster setup and it's just gonna step you through the process of creating a new extension. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different options in here. The one that we're gonna do is just this, this code snippet. Um, the other one that I've used a lot is just extension packs. So if you want to share your entire list of extensions across a team so that everybody's consistent, you can create an extension pack, tell them to, uh, or really just install that extension and it'll pull down all the extensions along with it. Uh, and I'm not gonna import anything here. Um, we'll call this just PowerShell Summit. And we're fine with that. Uh, the language ID that we're gonna use is PowerShell. And we will not initialize Git repository. And I messed up because this is already exists. Hold on one second. I was, I was practicing earlier and it clearly already had a conflict there. So one second. Um, and there you go. So very similar to the plaster set uh, layout. It actually even has the same green texts. I don't know if plaster took that same idea or where why it looks so similar, but that's kind of the general idea. And if we just open this up into VS Code, uh, you know, it's just a, a set of folders and files inside of that this uh, directory. Um, the main one that you're gonna be looking at is this package.json uh, file. Uh, and this is kind of where the, any kind of configuration that you're gonna be using for your package, uh, any metadata for your package is gonna go into this uh, packages.json file. Uh, when I actually need to write my snippets though, as you can tell from this reference, it's gonna go inside of this snippets directory. And I don't know if this is large enough, um, but it'll go inside of the snippets directory, nothing in there right now, uh, but that's kind of the general idea. Um, so yeah, I already have a slightly baked version of this though, and we'll, we'll take a quick look at that as well. And as you can tell, like my package.json file Still basically the same one from the template. Um, oh, and the other nice thing about this that comes with the Yeoman code generator is it also has these nice quick start guides. So I would definitely recommend, this is kind of the reason that I wanted to show you the entire process because if you need to understand the entire process of how this extension gets created, these quick start guides will really help you, guide you through the, the process of, of creating your first package. Um, but since we're, we're already a little bit more advanced, already have this baked version ready to go, uh, we'll skip ahead, uh, Rachel Ray style. Um, and so my snippets that I've, I've created are all inside of this snippets directory, ready to go. I've already got this packaged. Uh, and what we'll do now is actually run the package command, uh, which does require another extension, uh, another extension available in NPM called VSCE. Uh, it is created by the VS Code team, I believe. So I'm just gonna go into that directory and then use this package command. Um, so this base content URL that I'm entering in, this is just to establish in my readme file, uh, any kind of you know, reference URLs. 
it actually just it uses this as a part of expanding that, that uh, entire URL for it. Uh, and I'm not actually putting the repository information in this because this project uh, isn't technically, I think it is public, but uh, I'm not actually using this as a part of this. Uh, and when I just use VSC eco package, um, this is all still good. And there you go, it's uh, created my new package for me. And I am good to actually in import this. Now, the interesting thing about this is VS Code doesn't have a great way of creating and using your own marketplace. This, that's the only really big downside that I, I find to using these VSIX extensions is the marketplace that comes with v, uh, VS Code is just the, the, um, the marketplace from Microsoft. And there's no good way to add an additional marketplace like you can with Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio will let you add any other uh, feeds that you might have internally, whereas this is, is kind of limited. What you can do though, is, and if you wanna go this route, is you can run either uh, installing it to the user uh, extensions directory, um, that will run as, you know, install as that user, and uh, uh, you can use this uh, as a process in SCCM, or if you want to just do this uh, a little bit more easily, since I'm doing this in a demo, I'm just gonna install it directly from the VSIX. And then it should be installed as a rational Shiba's. And so that's my, my, my new extension that I just created. Uh, it, you know, it has this brief readme here, has links to any of the, the docs that I, I want to link to, uh, and just pulls me to my GitHub page. Uh, you know, just a nice and easy way for you to, to share your snippets across your team if you really want to. All right. So the last bit that I want to talk about is, of course, Codepilot. Uh, Copilot, where does it fit into this? You know, I'm doing a lot of stuff that seems like stuff that Copilot can do, and I think we're going to get there at some point. I think right now, you know, we're still having it learn from my processes, and when I'm using code in my own personal repository that's not using stuff that I have in, in my office repository, I'm finding it giving me varying different, you know, very different answers and different responses, not very consistent. It's not giving me that uniformity that I want, and I can't really rely and trust on it right now. You know, I want to establish standards. It's not gonna do that for me right now. Maybe over time, as it learns from my entire team's code process, it can establish that. I think it's not quite there uh, just yet. I, I definitely feel that you know, it's a very useful tool for writing new code, getting new standards across, but it's not great about being consistent. It's giving me very different answers each time I want to, to write uh, and doesn't give me that same level of control that I have with snippets. Uh, cool, so that, that's kind of everything that I want to cover. I ran a bit faster than I wanted to, but does anybody have any other questions? Happy to answer anything about either any of these topics that we covered. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I, I missed it, but how did you how did you get it to uh, the snippet to populate from the environment variables like the name of the file? Yeah. So that that's actually all built into uh, the snippet itself. So in that case, I actually used. Um, the environment variable tm uh, file name base. So if you actually look on the, the docs for snippets, there's a bunch of environment variables that you can call to, like dates or, or you know, file names, any references to the local machine. Those are all uh, you know, environment variables that you can call as a part of the snippet. But. And then what was the product that you used to build the VS Code extension? Was that Yeoman? Yeah, Yeoman Code Generator uh, is the one that actually pulls down the extension. And then VSCE is what actually creates the extension pack, extension itself. What's your deployment? You deploy it through SCCM, have it work, like just installs it, or? You would have, you'd have to put it inside of the user's, uh, I think it's user's uh, VS Code extensions directory. Um, that's probably the simplest way of deploying it. It, it should load it, yeah. Or you can uh, load a list as a part of uh, when you launch code, I think you can also load it that way. Uh, I haven't done it that way in a, a bit, but so I can't exactly remember the process. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I, I put that on there, and I am a, a little bit fast, so I can actually touch on that too if we want to talk about that. Cool. If yeah. Um, so yeah, script analyzer rules. Um, let me pull up my demo here. <clears throat> So yeah, anybody that's used PS Script Analyzer, um, you know, I recommend just using the community rules. To be honest, uh, they're a great standard. Um, there's really no reason to kind of deviate from those rules. I would say um, the biggest thing is that if you want specific quality of life kind of scenarios, that's the best case for why you'd want to deviate from any of the rules. Um, so to PS Script Analyzer, if anybody doesn't know, is just kind of a, a great linting tool. Um, it's built into VS Code out of the box, but if you haven't, um, are living just in the shell, you'll need to ins install the uh, actual module for this. Um, and it comes with a bunch of built-in rules already. These are all kind of built, on, uh, built for the community. Um, hard to display this very well, but the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and these are all best standards for how to write your code and how to, how to establish rules for your, your, your team. Um, so I have this function here that you know, uses pretty bad code practicing, you know, write host, uh, sort uh, n rather than sort object, where rather than where dash object. These are all kind of standards as a part of uh, the, the community script analyzer rule set. Um, I had some trouble with this earlier, so let me see. Yeah, it's not actually outputting the, the rules itself, but if I would go into the VS Code window, uh, where this lives, um, so I have this display bad code function. Um, it'll highlight any of the, the items that I, I don't want it to, uh, and I've actually already ruined this, one second. Um, so you know, it'll highlight any of the, the items that I, I want it to highlight that are, are essentially bad coding practices. Um, the ways around you know, establishing some of these, there, there are a couple ways of, of doing this, and I don't really know, again, there, there's no real best way of how to distribute the rules that you want to use, um, but what you can do is create uh, a set of files, and if uh, I can find them one second. Uh, what I use is actually, sorry, it's in the, the workspace rule set uh, that I've I created for this, so if I grab this directory. You can go ahead and actually ignore specific rules. So if I want to allow things like where in here, I can allow, uh, add that as a rule set that it'll allow that specific rule to ignore where, or if I wanted to add sort, it's just adding in sort or FL. Uh, those are all options that I can then add in to just say, ignore this rule when it runs. Or if I want to allow write host, I can just you know use this PS avoid write host rule and just let it run. You might be asking, like, where do I actually get that info for what that is? Um, when you actually run PS Script Analyzer, it, it actually displays the rule that it's hitting. Um, so that's where this PS used approved verbs is. That's where I'm actually getting that rule uh, for which ones to avoid, which ones to use. Um, and then when I'm actually in this version, you know, I've already kind of uh, gotten, I think I got rid of too many, so it's hard to tell where it. Uh, which ones it's allowing, but if I were to take out this FL here, save that. And if I come back here, it takes a, a second sometimes to reload it. Um, it should still highlight one of these. Yeah, it's not, not quite doing it a great job of demoing it, but that, that's generally the main idea is you, you create a, a PSD uh, one file that, or PSD1 file, yeah. PSD1 file that has the rules that you want to evaluate or not evaluate, any exceptions to the rules that you want to create, and then you, you can stick that inside of your uh, workspace as a setting and load that setting into your workspace. 
haven't really quite figured out the best way to distribute this because um, you can't put it as a part of the workspace, uh, as a part of the VS Code rules. It has to be a part of the workspace rules. Um, still trying to figure out a better way of distributing it, but that's kind of the general idea of whether you want to, you know, allow specific types of verbs or, or rules. Yeah, you can do it through this kind of framework here. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that gets a lot more complicated. Um, I, you can kind of do whatever, though. It is a PowerShell-ish code, um, but it gets very complicated very quickly. So I tend to stick to just the community rules myself. Cool, all good. Anybody any, have any other questions or want to see anything else? All right, thank you everybody. In case you want.